the World's Fair Podcast, Episode 31. In this episode, we talk with Stefano Gatti, the Director of International Affairs for Milan's Expo 2015, the next large World's Fair. We talk about the Expo's physical plan, as well as how they plan to present its theme of Feeding the Planet Energy for Life. Welcome to the World's Fair podcast. Uh, once again, this is Urso Chapel of ExpoMuseum.com. And uh, and once again, we have as my co-host, John McGregor in Brisbane, Australia. He is the founder of Foundation Expo 88. Uh, How are you? I'm doing pretty good. Uh, like some of the other podcasts we've done, we have a, a sort of wide range of geographies involved. Uh, I think we're, we are three uh, people here on the line, are three pretty equidistant across the planet, so uh, we're in completely different time zones, uh, so you have to bear with me, because it's way early in the morning for me, and way late for John, uh, but I will uh, hand things over to John for the introductions of our uh, guest. Thank you very much, Urso. It gives me great pleasure to introduce to, a, to introduce to our listeners a very special guest today from Milano Expo 2015. In fact, he is in Milan at this present moment in time. And his name is Mr. Stefano Gatti, uh, the Director of International Affairs for Milano Expo 2015. Now, uh, Mr. Gatti or Stefano was seconded to um, Expo 2015 from the Italian Ministry of Foreign Affairs. He's had over 20 years experience as a diplomat, including um, postings to the permanent mission to the United Nations in New York, to India, and also to NATO. It's our great pleasure to welcome you to the World's Fair podcast. Uh, Stefano, how are you? Thank you. Uh, very well, because it's uh, middle of the afternoon, so I'm the only one that is not uh, missing the sleep. <laughs> That's quite all right. <laughs> I need an excuse to get up early sometimes. So uh, we're really uh, privileged to have you on the podcast, and I uh, and I know John and I were very excited when Milan won the bid for, for Expo 2015. So if you could sort of give us a little bit of background and tell us how you got involved with Expo 2015 to begin with. Oh, thank you. I was I started working with the Expo 2015 company. That is a company that has been set up by the government of Italy with you know the mission of organizing the Expo in 2009. So uh, the the story of the candidature obviously comes from before that. As you know, we have been assigned the Expo in 2008, and then before that there was the whole uh, you know activity of the candidature. So there are people in our company that have done the whole thing since uh, the, the, the very beginning, but uh, I arrived a little bit later on when the company was set up. So the company that uh, in the BAE language is called The Organizer has been set up in April 2009. And from that moment has worked you know, very hard to fulfill all the different phases needed you know, uh, for the organization uh, of an expo. So now this makes it uh, two and a half years that is starting to be quite an experience in uh, the expo field. And um, where are we now in terms of the organizing for the Milan Expo? Um, we, we do have Yosu Expo, which is just about to start next week. Um, but in terms of participants especially, um, how many participants do we have for Milan? Um, no. Yes, absolutely. We are. We think they are. We are very well positioned, uh, in the sense that we um, set up a number of targets for the, to fulfil in terms of participation, especially country participation, and you know uh, international organisations. Uh, the official letter of invitation was issued by the government of Italy at the start of 2011, because, uh, as you surely know. Uh, the company, when it started, the first thing we had to do was to prepare what is called the registration dossier, that in a sense is a business plan that we have to present 
to the Bureau International des Expositions in Paris and to all the 157 countries that are part of this organization that manages the Expo. Once this uh, dossier with all the details, financial, organization, logistical, you know, how you intend to organize uh, the Expo and how you will work is examined and approved, and that happened in November of uh, 2010. At the beginning of 2011, the government of Italy issued to all the United Nations countries the official invitations to participate to the Expo. Today, oh. we have actually received the 82nd uh, confirmation. So we have 82 uh, conf uh, confirmed official participants, uh, that is 81 countries, uh, plus uh, the United Nations that has uh, uh, also uh, accepted the invitation. So we think it's uh, a very good result. Uh, actually, we are um, considering that we will probably have around 140 countries participating to our expo, and uh, uh, we have a target by the end of this year to reach uh, uh, 110. So we are very, very well set uh, uh, on our target. But what is most important is not only that we have uh, uh, an important number of uh, participants already confirmed, but most of them have already started preparing the participation to Expo Milan. Uh, what you have to do uh, when you are a country and you confirm the participation, you have to nominate a commissioner general. Yeah. Uh, more than uh, 30, 33 of these countries have confirmed the, the commissioner general. And actually last year we signed the first participation contract with Switzerland and we expect to sign around 50 to 20 contracts this year and then, you know, increasing substantially the number in the next two years because that is no, normally the um, time uh, moment when you start to uh, sign most of the contracts. Some countries have already launched their tenders for uh, the design of their pavilions and uh, the 24th of May we are actually presenting here in Milan together with the Swiss uh, Commissioner General, the uh, um, design, the exhibition design of the Swiss Pavilion that has already, you know, been adjudicated uh, and the tender has been uh, closed. Also, the the Germans have already launched their tender. Um, we are also assigning the exhibition spaces to many countries, you know, as a preparation for the signature of the contract. So I would say that we are very much inside the operational phase of the engagement of the countries. But as you know, there are not only countries that participate nowadays to expos, there are other categories of participation uh, to whom we attach great importance and my team uh, works and has also that specific uh, mission inside the company. So we are working also with uh, a number of international regions that will be present at the Expo with the corporate sector. Uh, actually, um, we have, uh, uh, as Expo 2015, uh, already concluded some uh, very important uh, also partnership with major companies that will be present uh, in a strong way at the Expo. Uh, we have uh, launched a number of, uh, you know, uh, international requests for proposals, uh, and we have uh, already uh, contracted uh, major companies like uh, Telecom Italia, Cisco, Accenture, uh, Enel, that is the Italian National Electric Company, and we are developing uh, a strongly technological approach also to our expo. Finally, we have another category of participants that is very important for us, that is civil society. So we are already discussing with around uh, a coalition of around 40 uh, uh, Italian and international uh, civil society organizations that will be actively participating to the Expo, and we are assigning a specific area of the Expo site that will then be you know, made live and managed and organized by these uh, um, NGOs. So as you see, we are trying to develop uh, uh, an Expo where all different categories of participants, as uh, the, the, you say it today is normally called all the stakeholders of the international yes. community actively yep. participating. Plus, obviously, well, that is the, the real added value of an expo, we expect millions of visitors. So the expo have today this really unique feature of putting together not only all the different stakeholders of the international community, you know, from the countries to the civil society organizations, but also to connecting them with millions of uh, common people, you know, the visit of the expo. We expect 20 million visitors. 
to our right. expo. More than a third coming outside Italy uh, from Europe and the rest of the world. So we expect a very uh, you know, universal expo, a really world expo, not an expo concentrated only on the visits uh, of uh, the visitors from the country, even if obviously yes. Italians would be very numerous. Yes, a, a third for um, visitors from outside of Italy is quite a high ratio. Usually at a world exposition, you will get about 5% or 6% of international visitors, but a third is a very high ratio indeed. Um, you mentioned that you are hoping to get 140 international uh, representations. Um, do you have a target for international um, organisations as well? Um, how many international organisations do you have at the moment uh, registered to participate? Yeah, now I, I will answer to that uh, really ma making a reference to the theme of the Expo. As you know, the, the theme of the Expo in Milan 2015 is uh, feeding the planet energy for life. So yes. is the, the issue of uh, nutrition and food that is one of the big challenges that humanity is facing today and all the connected issues, you know, sustainability, environment, uh, food safety, food security, right to food. So many really very important and, and key issues for the future uh, yes. of humanity. For this reason, we have identified two major priorities. That is United Nations system, of which a number of key parts of the United Nations. As you know, the United Nations, they have the Food and Agriculture Organization that is based in Rome, but they have also the yes. World Food Program, uh, so an, 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 a number of other agencies that deal with the issue of food, but they also have the World Health Organization the, uh, that obviously has a connection with food because food and health is a fundamental um, uh, key issue. UNICEF that deals, you know, with uh, um, hunger and all the issue of nutrition for children. So there are really many, many agencies of the United Nations that are interested. We invited the United Nations and already in April last year, the Secretary General replied to, uh, to the invitation of our Prime Minister, you know, accepting. And uh, we are developing, we have already set up a working group. Uh, the uh, Secretary General has uh, uh, given to uh, FAO, the Food and Agriculture Organization that is in Rome, the role of lead agency to organize a whole uh, United Nations world uh, for, and, uh, to, to participate actively. And we are also developing a very innovative way of presence of all the United Nations agencies that uh, play a, a key role on the issue of food. Uh, worldwide, uh, we, will, uh, we have proposed to them not to set up a specific you know, exhibition area, that we do not think is what the United Nations as such should do, but they should be present horizontally throughout the whole content and theme of our expo. And uh, we are working on different, you know, on the thematic pavilions with them, with an international competition on the best practices uh, on food and nutrition, on communication activities. Uh, we are partnering also with some major uh, companies. Microsoft is another one in which we are, you know, at the final stages of, uh, of important technical discussions in order to communicate and provide also food technology, a communication to all the visitors of, uh, you know, um, of, of who is doing what in terms of nutrition around the world. And we're working uh, uh, very closely with that with the uh, uh, United Nations, as I said. And we are setting up uh, a joint te uh, um, team between Expo 2015 and the United Nations that will uh, you know, uh, work from here to 2015 on all these different issues. We are also hoping to host uh, uh, a major, you know, event in 2015 by the United Nations in Milan, because as you know, 2015 is also the year in which the Millennium Development Goals of the United Nations uh, expire, come to their conclusion. So it will be a key year when the international community will take stock of what has happened, the results, if we have achieved these goals or not, and what uh, will the international community be doing in the future. So uh, we are often in Milan as a key uh, international platform where to develop this discussion and uh, you know, take forward the international community and the United Nations towards uh, you know, the after 2015, what will be eventually the new Millennium Development Goals that most likely will be called the, the Sustainable Development Goals because everybody now is, uh, is convinced that you know, the key issue when you confront uh, an important problem like uh, um, in nutrition in the world is uh, sustainable. So how do you provide necessary, healthy and secure food 
to all the people of the world uh, uh, in a sustainable way, respecting the environment, and that is uh, a key issue. So United Nations is one. As we have said, the, the whole United Nations system is very much involved and we're actively working. The second key interlocutor for us is the European Union, not only because the European Union, and we are in Europe, and Italy is a part of the European Union, but because, as you know, the European Union is a major player internationally for what regards the production and the distribution uh, of uh, food and you know, uh, nutrition worldwide. It has major programs. It has an, a common agricultural policy that is you know, a subject of intense discussions, both in Europe and worldwide. So is a major player in the issue of nutrition, what uh, the European Union, the 27 European Union countries will be doing or not doing in this field in the future is uh, extremely important for the whole world. Uh, so we have uh, uh, officially invited the European Union and we are expecting, we're already working with them, you know, in preliminary intense discussions, but they should confirm uh, very soon their participation and we will, we will set up a team also with the European Commission experts uh, to, uh, to deal and discuss with their participation. This is uh, the two key international organizations we're working with. Then there are a number of technical organizations that really deal with food. You know, there's uh, organizations in London that deal with the trade in uh, coffee, in uh, cocoa, so in a number of uh, very important different food staples, uh, one in Asia on rice. So these more specialized organizations are also key interlocutors for us, and we expect them you know, to participate actively uh, at the Expo in, in Milan. So overall, uh, um, we are extremely satisfied of the result. We have a very extended international participation, but also private sector participation and civil society. We are already partnering and uh, organizing events together with key NGOs like Save the Children, Oxfam, uh, and a number also of uh, Italian NGOs that are um, very active also in this field. So we think that we are um, progressing very positively uh, towards our target, that is, you know, to take in 2015 to Milan all the relevant entities and organizations that work on the issue of nutrition uh, worldwide. And, you know, our target is to transform Milan in 2015 as the place where you have to be if you want, you know, to discuss uh, and to uh, interact uh, and debate uh, the major issues of nutrition uh, in the world. Well, that's very, very exciting. And, and of course, I think what makes it even more exciting as a World Expo is that the theme itself, uh, Feeding the Planet Energy for Life, um, is really a, a unique theme, which I don't think has been covered before in World Expositions. Do you, what do you think, Urso? Well, I, I was going to say there, there have been a lot of World's Fairs with themes uh, related to uh sustainability and 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 the environment um and we have had you know a couple of of world's fairs around water themes but this is the first time there's really been one around food and i think it really does sort of allow a lot of different opportunities for different countries to approach it in a different way uh, a lot of times at uh, recent world's fairs with an environmental theme uh, a lot of countries have tended to uh, address the same issues over and over, but with a, 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 a theme around food and nutrition, I think that allows for a, a, a wide variety of approaches. Uh, so I think that that's really exciting, and I'm really interested to hear more about the the site itself and how the different participants will be um, displayed and how they'll be uh, geographically placed uh, to sort of stress that that same theme. Yeah, um, if I uh, if I can come in on that uh, and answer to your question, um, first of all, I would like to to say that we um, are trying uh, to present and propose to all the participants uh, a really innovative concept of Expo, uh, in the sense that our position uh, when we won the candidature and we started, you know, to really look at conceive the project of this expo was to examine also the history of the expo, a history that is very important, very significant for the progress of mankind, but also to ask the question to us, okay, the expos, world expos historically have played a key role, you know, in uh, um, sort of uh, uh, 
pushing forward the progress of mankind in the technological and the, uh, scientific sector to display and uh, you know to present to, to mankind some of the major you know technologies and progresses but is this the role today or what should be really the the role today is a little bit as if you look at the olympics olympics have been invented you know thousands of years ago in greece uh, and they are still an enormously powerful concept and very important but surely the olympics that you do today are not the ones that you are do were doing more than 2000 years ago in greece this is a little bit the same concept that we wanted to apply the idea the basic value of significance of an expo is still today extremely powerful. But uh, how can we produce an expo that is really up to the time, to what uh, the society and the world is today, that is an horizontal society, a social network, uh, a society, and also a society in where borders actually do not exist anymore, and do not have the same significance as, as they had long time ago. So this is a, a little bit of work, the work that we uh, have been doing. So the first answer is that we will not position the countries geographically because we think that is not what the world is today. And uh, we want also to um, propose an expo that, uh, in which the theme of the expo is not anymore a part, even if an important part of the project. So countries can have an important pavilion where they express themselves and then they dedicate and they focus a part of this on the theme or a part of the expo site is dedicated to the theme. We uh, want to um, set up an expo where the theme is everywhere. This is a little bit, you know, our uh, target and our byword. And when we say that the theme is everywhere, we say that the visitor, when she, he will arrive, he or she will arrive to the expo, will have to perceive the theme and the key messages of the theme already entering the expo, looking at the physical uh, aspect of the expo and then entering, you know, inside the uh, pavilion, the exhibition areas, and then experiencing the events. So everything, the technologies that are around, so everything has to be connected to the theme. And this expo is all about the theme. A theme that has to be presented in an innovative way. And as we have said, a number of countries will come with their national pavilions, uh, uh, autonomous national pavilions, but they will not be placed on a geographical basis, but they will be mixed, uh, um, organizing them, themselves uh, uh, around the thematic itineraries. Plus, a number of countries that are the majority will um, participate and directly be placed inside thematic clusters. So, a group of countries that have a common theme, well, connected to nutrition, that they want you know, to express, uh, that is their challenge, uh, and on which they will be collaborating together, uh, developing also common areas and common part of the exhibition area, uh, in addition of having their own specific uh, um, exhibition area and pavilion uh, dedicated to their country. So when you say clusters, can you give us a bit more information about that? This, we are proposing uh, um, to countries uh, two different ways of coming. One is the traditional way to come to an expo. You can have a specific area bigger or smaller depending on the financial resources the technical capabilities that you have uh, and develop that area with your own exhibition project that you have to submit to the expo organizer we approve it and then you do it you build it so big countries like germany you know uh, france uh, china will come and have uh, their own pavilion their own exhibition area but the majority of the countries in the world actually find this quite difficult because it's challenging both uh, financially, but also, you know, technically, logistically to conceive, build a certain area, managing it through six months with hundreds and thousands and millions of visitors is not an easy exercise. So a number of countries can do it. For others, is normally difficult. So what has happened in previous expos, they have solved this issue doing something that is called the joint pavilion. So the organizers were sort of building big uh, exhibition areas big boxes inside of these boxes like a little bit in a fair they were giving you know a specific uh, space exhibition area normally small 
to uh, all the countries, developing world countries, smaller countries, eh? and they were setting them up there. You know, these countries show, could pay a rent of, of, if there were countries uh, supported by the organizer because there were, you know, least developed countries and very poor countries. Uh, um, eventually, they had this area for free. But then if you go to previous expo, you, you are surely you have done it you will see you know the africa pavilion the joint uh, caribbean pavilion the joint uh, asian pavilion and so on and so forth and then you find you know the sort of smaller country the b countries of the world participating and then the big ones you know have their pavilions outside we thought that this is a representation of what today is international society that is not up to the time anymore if then you look at the issue of nutrition Many of these smaller and or poorer countries are the ones that really have an added value to give. They have the um, strongest biodiversity. You know, they are um, some of the biggest food staples of mankind originate from them. I don't know if many people know that, you know, the rice, that is one of the main uh, food staples of mankind, originates from Sierra Leone. Uh, and so they are all that Ivory Coast produces two thirds of the uh, cacao in the world. So all these things uh, are key informations and, and messages that need to pass you know, to the, the visitor that can pass if you organize these countries in a different way. So what we said to these countries and to the BAE in Paris, we do not want to set up the joint pavilions because we think that is not the right kind of solution. And in many instances, they do not provide uh, a uh, dignified and acceptable way for a number of countries to present itself and provide an added value to, uh, to the Expo, we are proposing that countries group uh, uh, around specific common themes and issues. And we started to discuss with many of these countries, you know, what were the themes of interest for them? Why do they want to come to an Expo? What do they want to present to an Expo? And you wouldn't be surprised that many of these even, you know, less developed countries what they really didn't want to present is hunger. So hunger is obviously an issue in the world, but they will say, you know, if I am a country where a number of my people are suffering on issues you know, of, of nutrition, what is my interest uh, to come, you know, in a place for six months and display this? Obviously, I want to participate in a discussion, a debate where I find the solutions, I find the technologies, but for me also to escape from the poverty trap and develop myself economically, using my resources is the first issue. So really what these countries have as resources to present to the world, the peculiarities, the added value, their culture behind it, this is what these countries want to take coming to the Expo and what we an Expo is interesting to present to millions of visitors. This doesn't mean that we won't confront also the serious and key issues, you know, of poverty, um, hunger, but those will be part of the events, of the conferences, but when countries come and have the exhibition area, they really have to display their richness and their resources. The result of this process also of dialogue and discussion with many of these countries is that we have agreed with them nine different thematic clusters. So nine areas in the Expo site where a number from four to ten countries will group together in a common exhibition area that you have to consider a little bit like a village. You know, we as an organizer will develop and build this village, but each country will have its own house. So it will have its own uh, autonomous, you know, uh, space where to develop also the peculiarity, but they will also have, you know, a common uh, piazza, a common library, common services, and places that will be dedicated to a certain theme uh, where these countries will be working and collaborating together with us and the organizer. And we have come out with nine titles of the Expo, uh, of the Expo clusters, uh, inside of which around 80 of the 140 countries participating will be present. So it will be a very key feature of our Expo. And uh, uh, I give you the list of the nine titles from which you will understand, you know, what is our approach. So the, uh, six of these uh, clusters are uh, organized around food, key food staples. One is rice, so there's the cluster of, of rice uh, that is titled Rice, Abundance and Security. Then there's a cluster on coffee, that is the title is Coffee, the Engine of Ideas. One on cocoa, 
that is cocoa, the food of gods. Then we have one cluster on legumes, oils, seeds, and fruits that are key you know, to the biodiversity and the nutrition in the world. Another cluster, is, the title is the world of spices. Another one is all the new crops. And that is also a very key issue, you know, discussion at international level that uh, uh, internationally, uh, everybody is eating more or less, you know, the same key things, but there are some crops and, and uh, uh, products of nature around the world that, that present uh, a fundamental nutritional value that should be better developed. One example is that next year it will be the International Year of the Quinoa. And the quinoa that is produced essentially in Bolivia, but in several other countries, is a, a, a seed that has an incredibly you know, strong nutritional value and can be eaten by people that have, a, a, you know, celiac people. So people that have problems uh, digest, digesting the gluten that is inside mm. some uh, cereals. Then we have other free thematic um, uh, clusters that uh, are, one is called the Bio-Mediterranean, that is, so the Mediterranean biology, health, beauty, and harmony. So all the connection, all, as you know, of the Mediterranean diet, but also the biodiversity on nutrition that you find around the Mediterranean, of which obviously Italy is a central part. So this specific cluster will be located just, you know, uh, beside the, uh, the, the part of Italy, inside the uh, site of the expo. Then another one is island, the sea, and food. And the last one is the challenge of water scarcity and climate change. So we will have a number of countries that represent a lot of, you know, desertic areas uh, or have uh, uh, scarcity of water. And there they will present, you know, how do they face these, uh, these problems and what are the technologies and the solutions also in terms of crops and produ production of food uh, to solve, uh, you know, um, feeding their people in these difficult, difficult uh, climates. So as you see, overall, there are nine different thematic clusters that will offer also an interesting uh, uh, opportunity to visitors. You can imagine that, you know, when uh, one of the millions of visitors will come and they have only a choice based on countries, uh, probably, you know, the, the most well-known countries of the world are the ones that will be visited. So if you are a normal family, as it was in Shanghai, when I went to the expo in Shanghai, the Chinese family enters it, and the conversation, I saw a number of them say, you know, where do we go? So the first thing is that they went to the volunteers, to the girls, say, where do I have to go? And obviously the volunteers, they said, you know, they, they answer to you, I don't know, where do you want to go? <laughs> and then at that point, they choose the, the country they know better. So everybody was, you know, outside the United States, France, Italy was a very popular pavilion, and um, whatever. But you really didn't have the opportunity to discover those countries, those resources, you know, the, the richness of the world that are the countries and the places people do not know about. So we thought that, uh, in, you know, you probably won't be going to the exhibition area of Sierra Leone as, as your first choice, but if you go, in the cluster of rice, you will meet Sierra Leone there because from Sierra Leone, all the different kinds of rice come in the history of humankind. So, so on for coffee, so on for you know legumes, for the spices, and so on and so forth. From each of these clusters, there will be then a thematic itinerary for the visit of the people that will connect also some bigger countries. So countries like India, Japan, or China will actively participate to the issue of rice, not because they are placed inside uh, the rice cluster, because they will come with big exhibition areas, but there will be a stop inside, you know, part of the itinerary on rice that will be built starting from the rice uh, cluster. So this uh, solution also of building thematic itineraries for the visit uh, uh, of the people that buy the ticket and enter the, into the expo is also a way of making these countries collaborate between themselves on common theme and engage also the international organization, the civil society in this sort of common work. Because each of these clusters will have a common exhibition area on the issue, on rice, on coffee, on legumes, on spices, and so on and so forth, where we will present the key messages, you know, in agreement with all these countries. So one of the innovations we want to present is an expo as a collaborative effort where countries do not come inside and they replicate the borders 
uh, that they have in the physical world, but actually they pass over those borders and they use the occasion of the expo as an occasion to uh, collaborate together, present a unique experience to, for the visitor, uh, but also, you know, pass over the borders and uh, start to work together. But the interesting thing of these clusters is uh, then you will have countries from different parts of the world. So rice, you will have countries from Africa, you will have countries from uh, Europe, you will have countries from uh, Asia. Coffee, the same thing. You will have African countries, you know, Uganda is a big producer of coffee, Indonesia is a big producer of coffee, Papua New Guinea produces the most expensive coffee in the world. Not many people know about this. So it's a way really to approach it in a new and different way, an innovative way, uh, the, the experience of the visitor, but also the participation uh, of the countries. I'm sure that um, this is a, a very new and innovative way of looking at the theme and how the theme is then articulated into the sub-themes uh, through this cluster approach. Um, just one very quick question before I pass it back to Urso. Um, you mentioned that one of the clusters was old and new crops. So when you say new yep. crops, do you mean genetically modified foods? Is that what you mean as well? or No, uh, no. Uh, <laughs> when, not exactly in the sense that when we, the, 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 the cluster has all the new crops and then an undertitle that is cereals and tubers. So we say all the new crops in the sense that both in the tubers and in the cereals, there are specific crops around the world that are not used. So they are limited to a small area, but if they could be more widely used, will uh, uh, give a good contribution to the nutrition of mankind. So when we're speaking about oh, okay. new crops, is using crops that... But let me say one important thing, that is this. This expo is a debate of the international community about the issues of nutrition. We, as uh, the expo organizer, do not have a specific position on something. We, our mission has been set up, you know, to organize a, a, a big event where everybody comes and express its position. So let me say that all the most controversial issues will be discussed in our expo because uh, you obviously um, highlighted the uh, genetically modified food, but you can have, a, I can give you a list of other seven, or eight very controversial and highly discussed issues that today regard nutrition. We want to take and we will take all these issues to the Expo. And in order to provide as Expo a platform for discussion, for debate, we also think that the best thing to, you know, uh, take forward the discussion of the international community is to approach all these issues uh, uh, not on a political or, let me say, theological or, you know, uh, ideological, let me say, probably that is the best word, way, but on, you know, the technical ground. What happens on the ground? What are people doing? What are their problems? And do some of these solutions really present, you know, a solution of their problems? Uh, so this is our approach, and all the different issues will have to be discussed. So I'm sure that I can anticipate that in many of these clusters, and also the events, because these clusters will have also meeting rooms, places where you will have food and beverage. So obviously the visitor will, you know, go in the coffee cluster and have the possibility of trying all the possible coffees of the world, but also be educated what is behind that. And the same thing for all the uh, other clusters. And we will be discussing and we are partnering up exactly, you know, with the United Nations, with the European Commission, with some major international organizations, but also with the civil society organizations to organize a programs of events Discuss, discussions, debates, seminars, exactly on these issues. So, yes, we will also be uh, discussing, we will be presenting uh, some of these key issues because we cannot run away from them. We have to confront them and discuss, uh, discuss them, and we welcome you know, everybody that has uh, a position on this to use the Expo as a moment of confrontation and looking in a practical way, you know, uh, involving also who are the actors in the world that really have uh, the issue of uh, producing this food and receiving this nutrition, you know, what, what are the best solutions. This is one of the reasons why we will have also some very important thematic areas developed and organized by the organizer, 
So not only the countries uh, in itself, not only the um, countries that will come in the thematic clusters, but we as an organizer, we uh, are working on five different, uh, you know, areas of uh, connected to the theme inside the expo site. One is what we call the Pavilion Zero, and we are uh, presently uh, working working very closely with some of the best curators in the world, both from Italy and outside Italy and with the United Nations, to develop a major pavilion. It will be a very big one, more than 30,000 square meters, that will present and introduce the theme of the Expo. So essentially, visitors will start. Uh, it's at the beginning, of, uh, it's at one of the two entrances of the Expo site. So people will get in and have a first, you know, a major exhibition where they will be presented the theme of the expo, the issues, the history, obviously, connected to mankind, of nutrition and how um, how um, mankind has influenced food and how food and nutrition has influenced the development of mankind, but also what is the present-day debate of the international community. So the Millennium Development Goals, more than half of them are connected to the food. What are the uh, targets that the international community is developing for the future? And, and also inside this pavilion, we will present the result of a major international competition of best practices on the theme of food, where we will select around 30 of these best practices around the world and present them in this exhibition and have also the people that are behind these practices, uh, these solutions that really are making a difference around the world in terms of nutrition, food security, food safety, come to our expo, illustrate with events, uh, uh, so we, we need also the people that are behind what is really happening uh, around the world on nutrition to be present. This was also be presented in one in this thematic pavilion that will be the biggest thematic pavilion in the history of Expos. Then we will have a thematic pavilion in food in art. That is also so the cultural value also of food and nutrition that is very important, both in um, you know uh, contemporary art but also in the history of art. We will have a future food district. With, we are partnering with the Massachusetts Institute of Technologies to develop you know, the solutions that will be presented in this uh, uh, thematic pavilion that will be called, the, as I said, the future food district. We will have the supermarket of the future. We will have the house of the future. How will we feed ourselves? in the future, or how will our houses be, how will we shop in the future, these are key issues. We are also partnering with important, important international entities on a sustainable food pavilion. Um, by the way, um, uh, some of these entities are in, uh, in California, it is uh, uh, an American uh, um, uh, university that is called UC Davis, so probably you mm -hmm. all know it. Very well. They are this project of a sustainable food pavilion. They are partnering some, with some major um, foundations like, you know, the Kellogg Foundations and others, and they will present, you know, the issue in collaboration with us of sustainable food. So there will be a sustainable food pavilion. And, and we will also have a thematic areas of biodiversity where people, you know, will be looking at, you know, different products of the world, how they are developed, and, you know, how biodiversity is a key elements and we need to preserve you know, the biodiversity of our planet in order to preserve the diversity of the food and the food sources in our planet. So this is just to give you an idea that we have also these thematic areas that are uh, extremely important and as I said before we have also an entire part of the expo site that will be the home of the civil society. So it's uh, all the, actually a, a farmhouse uh, that uh, uh, were an integral part of the economic development of the Lombardy region that was very strong in agriculture before becoming, you know, the um, one of the, uh, the industrial powerhouses and financial powerhouses of the world. And this old farm uh, yard will be, that's very big, will be completely restructured and will present uh, offices, meeting halls, uh, exhibition areas that will be given to the civil society organization and they will, you know, manage with a high degree of autonomy and presenting also their content and their point of view on some of the key issues uh, of nutrition because around the world, civil society plays uh, a really fundamental role. So putting all these different components together, collaborating with the countries, the international organization, the civil society, the corporate sector, we are 
aiming at presenting a very rich uh, um, content of Expo 2015. All this will be then glued together with a very, str with a very strong technological effort. You can expect, and we do expect, that in 2015, 100% of our tickets will be sold online, and uh, more than 90% of the people that will enter the expo will have a handheld device in their hand. So we are partnering with all these major technological companies, as I told you before, you know, from Cisco to Telecom Italia, uh, Accenture, Microsoft, in order to display, we are actually have also some Asia, uh, important Asian countries. We are very, you know, uh, very forward stage of discussion. So we are hopeful they will come in also. And we intend to uh, develop inside the Expo site a sort of smart city in the future, where the visitors will be able to, you know, go around with their device and uh, uh, interact with their device with all the technological display and content and take it away with them when they go uh, away. So that is also one other important innovation, we want to develop uh, an innovative experience, visit experience of the general public, strongly based on the concept of a technological smart city. The more, the more you say, the more I'm, I'm very excited about the possibilities here, because, you know, in, in sort of World's Fairs historically, they were always sort of generally grouped geographically, and, and that trend has really become stronger over the years and in, in the recent large expos they've grouped the pavilions completely by, by geography which creates these sort of ghetto areas uh, for better lack of a better exactly. term um that aren't as visited and sometimes the, some of the best things at an expo are in those those areas and so i'm really excited about that and the possibility for collaboration between countries that you don't normally associate with each other uh, the, you know, completely different geographies, completely different parts of the world, and the fact that they'll be collaborating on on something uh, similar to both of them, I I think is a really exciting possibility. And you know, one of the things that that really attracts me to to world's fairs is they do become sort of worlds unto themselves. They become sort of a the, you know a, a laboratory for for showing the the possibilities in the greater world. And I like to think that in the greater world, people are mixed together and from different backgrounds. And to have that happen physically in the pavilions, I think, is, is really exciting. Although I, I, I will tell you that, that uh, uh, you'll be able to find all of the Americans on the site because they'll all be hanging out in the coffee area. Uh, I, that's, a, that's a prediction I, I, will, I, am, I will make right now that I think will we'll, we'll, will be true in 2015. So I, I'm really sort of excited about that and, and it, really excited about the fact that different organizations from all around the world are, are, and, and companies around the world are, are involved in this. And I, I think it really does sort of speak to the reality of where we are in the world right now, that, that, that borders aren't as important. And sometimes, you know, collaborations between Estonians, Thais, and you know Cambodians <laughs> are you know are, are are you know Ukrainians and Argentinians. I mean, those kind of combinations I think can really prove some of the you know richest possibilities at something like that. And I, I I'm really excited to see what is happening here. And I hope that this trend continues in the future. This this sort of organization because I think this really is a, a complete game changer. Uh, with World's Fairs. Um, we don't have much time left. I don't know if, John, you had anything uh, else you wanted to add. Yeah, no, I just wanted to say I agree with you completely, Urso. In fact, it, it almost brings it back to the very, very early days of the World Exposition, back to 1851, the Crystal Palace, when when all of the, when most of the international representation was based on thematic lines, not geographical lines, you know, so coming back to the basics, um, cereals, rice, and things like that, and also technological innovations. So it's very interesting to see an expo here, which is going to be clustered according to those thematic uh, clusters, not just geography. I, I think that's it's, it's it's going to be very very interesting indeed. I, I guess the 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 sort of final sort of question I have is 
you know, many times when you're talking about such serious issues as the environment and sustainability and food security and and uh, nutrition is that these can seem very dry topics uh, for an event that you're trying to attract millions of people to go to, uh, quite frankly, because it's fun. So I'm always interested in hearing how organizers uh, plan to to uh, strike that balance between giving information and and allowing for very serious discussion, but also giving visitors the opportunity to experience something that's fun or something that they've never seen before. I'm sort of curious as to how um, how Expo 2015 plans to sort of deal with that as an issue. Yes, I mean, that is a very pertinent question. And obviously is one of the things in which we have focused uh, uh, really very much uh, of our attention. Um, what we uh, will want to do, one of the sort of uh, innovations that we want to take in the approach of the Expo is this idea of uh, a, a visitor-centric experience. If you look at the history of Expos, they have had a fundamental role in, uh, in developing humankind also recently. But um, the, the fact what I was most stricken is uh, looking at the, and going to the uh, very last ones was how, in a sense, you know, the center of all this world uh, that you very correctly said is a world in itself and extremely fascinating, extremely, you know, uh, opening up uh, the future of avenues also of, uh, of what the international community will be. The visitor is not necessarily, you know, at the center of all this thing. And there were also instances, you know, where you, you have very long queues, uh, you know, without any kind of shade and uh, places where people sit down and things like that. And you really see that uh, this is not of la luck, you know, of, of planning. It's just that in the mind also of the organizer, it was clearly said that, you know, and the more the participants that are, you know, all the countries of the world, the international community, uh, then the visitor is at the center of all this. We think that the answer to your question on making, you know, this extra attractive is to change in completely the focus. The visitor has to be at the center of everything. We have to work with all the participants in order to provide an unforgettable experience. How can you do this? There are different ways. First of all, first way is really be thematic. So really the issue of feeding, feeding ourselves, you know, feeding our people, feeding the planet in the future is really something that has a, and it encounters a very strong interest by everybody and everywhere around the world. You know, whatever country you come, whatever uh, social you know, background you have, the economic background or whatever professional background is uh, an issue strong and deep and personal interest. In a sense, you know, some people have said, and think it's correct that we are what we eat. So we really have to uh, develop this concept and give an unforgettable experience to the visitor. The second way, as we said, is technology. The possibility, you know, replicating what is the horizontal uh, society that we have today inside the Expo site. People can come, can communicate. They need not only passively to look at something, have an experience, but interact. So interactivity is fundamental, and we are putting that as a guidelines for the uh, visitors. You have to be creative. And then finally, let me say to you as an Italian, that so we have this, the basis of our culture is this, is the quality of life and the quality of the experience. And one of the key issues of, you know, and a quality of experience of life is food. That is one of the reasons why so many million people come to Italy every year. And uh, we want to replicate the same level of comfort, uh, of experience uh, on a worldwide basis. Have all the uh, countries of the world, all the participants of the world come and work with us uh, in order to present uh, food uh, you know, uh, in an Italian way, in the sense, each with their own culture, but in a way that really is pleasant, is creative, uh, for the people is based on, you know, you show your cultural background, uh, you educate people through the experience of food. So let me say that anyhow, at the end of the day, food uh, 
after another uh, another element that I won't mention is one of the two things most attractive for any human being. And uh, so we will provide an experience uh, of food, uh, a cultural experience, uh, an entertaining experience, but an important experience on food and nutrition. And that, if you do it well and properly, is one thing that will definitely attract millions of people to come there. And then when they come, you engage them in the strong and serious debates that you need to have on hunger, on OGM, on whatever you need to have, because that is also an important part of the expo. Well, I, I hate to say it, but we're we're kind of running out of time here. But I, uh, I, I there's just so much I can't wait to find out more about the plans of 2015, and I uh, can't wait but to can, be involved. Can I, in... can I then take the occasion just to say that uh, um, I would like to invite you both uh, to our next international participant meeting that is taking place 10, 11, and 12 October in Milan. Uh, and uh, I would like also uh, to uh, check if you would like to uh, a little bit, you know, animate uh, uh, a blog or a forum on this uh, uh, at our international participant meeting. It's a way, you know, uh, I see that obviously you observe, you study, you comment, you analyze uh, expos. So my proposal is come, come to one, but to one also not only when it's already organized, but come you know, to see how we, sort of the challenges and the difficulties of uh, preparing one. And we will be extremely uh, happy to, you know, uh, organize with you in, uh, in a way to have you here, but also see how through our uh, technology and communication means uh, we could have you and uh, be actively engaged in uh, blogging out and uh, informing uh, people and who follows also your uh, your work about, uh, you know, the, an inside view of uh, organizing an expo. Well, I, I would definitely love to be involved on, on something, and we'll definitely have to talk about that. Uh, but, uh, yeah, I'll have to figure out how, how, how the, the, the logistics of that, but uh, but certainly I... We, we, we would like really to have people that, you know, come in and sort of... Uh, even third voices, you know, neutral parts, scam, assist, comment, uh, suggest, uh, and sort of uh, help us to animate. We do not have the, the solutions for everything, but we think that uh, an expo is also part of this uh, uh, sort of collaborative approach, uh, especially of people that do have an experience, do know about the expos, and have really contributions to give. Yeah, and I and I, I will also add that I'm really excited about that your organization's outreach to lots of different areas that that previous world's fairs hadn't really done which is uh things like uh here in san francisco we have the america's cup coming up and i know that expo 2015 is is uh sponsoring one of the the yachts at the race here to to sort of let people know in san francisco about about the expo and um that's something i haven't seen happen at, with other expos and i'm i'm um really encouraged by that so it's been a great podcast. Thank you so much, Stefano. Um, that's been so informative and insightful as well. Um, we could go on for hours and hours, I'm sure, but I think I think we do have to, you know, stop there. So, um, well, in the next stop. three years, we will have more hours to do that. Uh, no, yes. but, <laughs> but think about October. I think it's a good occasion to to start to go in depth. Uh, uh, on these things, and then we have also, by the way, a team uh, or our people that you know we have a web team that works on our web communication. Uh, so it's you know uh, it would be interesting also for you to meet them and, and see what kind of collaboration we can have. Well, thank you so much for for being a part of our podcast, and I, um, I, I'm I'm sure our listeners will 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 have gotten a lot out of this, and and will have even more. Uh, questions and and want to find out more in in the future and um, and we have uh, uh, okay. three years to tell everyone. <laughs> Absolutely. So Fantastic. thank you very much. Bye. Goodbye. Thank you. As always, we'd like to thank our listeners as well. Without listeners, we'd just be talking to ourselves. You can help us out in many ways, but mostly by providing feedback. You can email me at urso at expomuseum dot com. That's u r s o at expomuseum dot com are calling our question and comment line, 650-ASK-EXPO. Despite the name, you can leave questions or comments there, and we'll play them in a future episode of the podcast, or not if you instruct us not to. 
Uh, naturally, we have websites. You can find out more about the World's Fair podcast at worldsfairpodcast.com. The podcast is a project of expomuseum.com, and John's organization can be found at foundationexpo88.org. Expo 2015's official site is at expo2015.org. You can also find us all on Twitter with the following names, at Expo Museum, at Urso Chapel, that's U-R-S-O-C-H-A-P-P-E-L-L, at F Expo 88, and at Expo 2015 Milano. Not surprisingly, we're on Facebook at facebook.com slash Podcast. In our next podcast, episode 32, we'll be looking back in time instead of forward, back to 1888 Centennial International Exposition in Melbourne, Australia. Once again, thanks. Thanks.